put up five million dollars in one day in one day to fund uh, Substack. Now, Substack had already raised tens of millions of dollars. They didn't need any more capital. But what they did in that exercise is they locked in some of their most successful, most passionate uh, authors on this. But the traditional pattern was for someone to get a quality introduction to me as a first test of their resourcefulness. Now, if I am a similarly educated black woman in Baltimore who attended uh, Johns Hopkins instead of Stanford. Trying to get an introduction to venture capital might require three or four steps, even though I'm equally qualified. Crowdfunding being a modern version of friends and family rounds. What exactly did you mean by that? Hi everybody, this is Nat Myers back with the Raises.com Top Capital Razor Show. And today I introduce Devin, who is a very fast named guest. So Devin has a 25 year career in the financial services industry. And I mean, he's, he's an author, he works at a bank, he worked at a corporate treasury with over $1 billion in revenue. So today he brings together a wealth of knowledge you know, after he, he successfully ran a broker dealer, uh, understands capital raises and mergers and acquisitions. And Devin, it's great to meet you here. Thank you so much. It's a, an honor to be invited. Thanks for having me, Natu. No worries. And, and so it's, it's really refreshing talking to somebody of your caliber, somebody who's been in the trenches and you're seeing things from you know, your perspective. So I guess maybe we can start on crowdfunding because that's something that you're you're one of the most knowledgeable people that I've seen about this topic. So maybe we can start by asking, um, or even before we go into crowdfunding, first maybe if, from your perspective, you can introduce yourself to the audience and then we can go into crowdfunding. Oh, sure. Well, it's an honor to be here. Thanks for having me. You know, I, I did have a, a 25 year finance career before I launched a second career focused on social impact. And as I've been working in that space, you know, my finance roots try to connect me right to the work I'm doing in social impact. And what I keep finding over the years, I come back to crowdfunding, investment crowdfunding, the regulated investment crowdfunding as a capital raising tool has the potential to be just a tremendously impactful tool. We're already seeing that um, diverse founders, uh, folks, frankly, who look like you uh, are having more success proportionally in raising crowdfunding than they do in raising venture capital. I, I'm excited about that potential. Uh, if we can grow this community, I, I believe that will continue to scale and we'll see that happening. Women are having much more success. We see social entrepreneurs having much more success in this space. We see all kinds of businesses using the tool, right? Whether you're talking about venture capital, real estate, uh, or, or you know, dividing up equity interests in other projects, all kinds of things are now happening in the crowdfunding space under these rules. And it's exciting because it allows everyone to participate in owning cool stuff uh, <laughs> that has the opportunity to make money and support uh, the kinds of things we all care about, whether that whether you're focused on clean air, social justice, improve public health, there are opportunities to invest profitably in all of those things. So it's it's a cool time and I'm having all kinds of fun trying to leverage my finance background for good. Oh no, 100%. And uh, yeah, no, this is a very interesting topic uh, that we're gonna dive in. So uh, one, one thing that you mentioned though, you just mentioned, you mentioned the, the line about diverse. I just bring this up quickly, not to ostracize some of the viewers, but we have a lot of diverse founders, mainly because people look at me and then people who look like me end up joining our service, not because we're targeting them, but just because maybe, who knows? But that being yeah. said, why, why do you think uh, crowdfunding seems to have more uh, legs for some people than venture capital? And why is that? Why isn't it the same for yeah. both sectors? I, yeah. There are two reasons. One, let's talk about the traditional way that venture capitalists have screened deals. Now, I, I will say they're getting better and they're trying hard, some of them, to change their patterns, recognizing the inherent flaw in this. But the traditional pattern was um, 
I'm going to uh, wait for someone to get a quality introduction to me as a first test of their resourcefulness. And that test is intriguing uh, and, and it seems very objective on the first layer, on the kind of the first cut, right? Um, because you're not setting any racial or gender or any other kind of barriers. The only test is, can do you have the resourcefulness to get to me? But when we step a, a step back and say, okay, there's a huge concentration of venture capital in, in Silicon Valley. So if I am uh, a white Stanford grad, and I'm looking to get an introduction to a quality venture capitalist, Chances are, if I don't know one firsthand, I know a dozen people who can make that introduction for me. Now, if I am a similarly educated Black woman in Baltimore who attended uh, Johns Hopkins instead of Stanford, trying to get an introduction to venture capital might require three or four steps, even though I'm equally qualified, right? I am just differently situated. So it isn't, it isn't a fair system. So that so one problem is the screening system venture capitalists have traditionally used. So that's the problem with venture capital as I see it in terms of diversity. Then on the other side of the coin, when we're talking about crowdfunding, what's going on there is crowdfunding starts by reaching out to the people in your community, the people you literally know. And so everybody knows somebody. And so uh, Black founders, like everyone else, when they jump into crowdfunding, they have some success raising from their community. And then they are simple, similarly advantaged or disadvantaged when they reach out to the broader community. I would also say that there appear to be, at this stage, a higher percentage of investors who are seeking out diverse founders through crowdfunding. There's an organization called uh, the 10K Project that is designed around 100% focus on funding Black founders. Generally speaking, they use, they're use they backing people who are raising through crowdfunding deals. Um, and so we see others as well, individuals and, and organizations beginning to focus on women and other diverse founders from their various lenses. And so it is working for entrepreneurs. Now it's not a magic well of water, right? You can't just go and ask and get it for any dumb thing. But, but what we are seeing is that the founders that have the real commitment to, to success and are doing all the hard things, are having success raising money through crowdfunding. It's, it's so interesting how geography bound things were, and um, it's almost democratizing the playing field for people that can produce cash flow, obviously for investors and for users. So, um, yeah, you know, it's an interesting uh, shift up. So, one thing one thing that we we're discussing offline uh, is the fact that there are some companies that do all of their fundraising via crowdfunding. And then in some companies, they may do half of it or a part of it or the first part of it, uh, and then the rest using venture capital and so on, some, so, some hybrid. So yeah. like, maybe we can explore different strategies of like, okay, should I start with crowdfunding first and then go to venture capital? Or what companies or examples of companies do each, like do just crowdfunding or just do venture capital or do a hybrid of both? Yeah. So I can think of four examples of companies that have raised exclusively via crowdfunding or I, or at least predominantly via crowdfunding. But like uh, there's a, a woman based woman founded company called Tampon Tribe uh, that has raised all of their capital via crowdfunding. They started with a Kickstarter campaign, you know, not a regulated investment crowdfunding campaign, but a traditional rewards campaign. And they have stayed with that process of building a, uh, you know, kind of leveraging their literal tribe, their group of customers to fund them in each round. And they did an equity round and they've done now done some low cost debt rounds, relatively speaking. And so, so they have raised layer upon layer of really showing some sophistication over time in 
in capitalizing their business. And, and they've built quite a successful business with millions of dollars in revenue and lots of customers. Um, so that's, you know, an example of one that's gone that way for a hundred percent. Another one, I, I first talked to these guys when they were just getting started. I had uh, the founder of, uh, of this company that they make um, collapsible homes that are like genuine homes, right? So they, they're made in a factory and then uh, delivered on site. But instead of going down this, the highway as a, as a big giant box, right? They are collapsed. So you could, you could put six of them on one big truck, right? Haul six to a location, pop up six or deliver six around a city, right? And, you know, bring in the crane, plop it down, set it, and they can be operational a couple of days. It's called Boxable. And I think they've raised on the order of $75 million now. And their last round was done at a $3 billion valuation. So this is a company that really is making it happen and, you know, supporting affordable housing in a way that is pretty darn radical. So they're having great success, uh, kind of at the other extreme of, of the range. But we see a company called Aptera that has raised all of its money through crowdfunding. They're, they're building uh, solar powered electric vehicles uh, and, and really a promising, exciting company. They're trying to raise venture capital. They haven't been able to convince a venture capital firm to come in yet. Uh, it'll be interesting to see. Uh, they they have admitted they need another fifty million dollars, and so it'll be interesting to see what they've done. They've raised about fifty million dollars already from the crowd. Um, and uh, another one called Jewel Case has done round after round of of crowdfunding. They're they're building electric batteries that are used for all kinds of things. Um, but they they started with uh, batteries that you could buy for a, I think they were selling for about five hundred bucks that would power your laptop at a trade show all day, so you didn't have to pay the fee to have power at your booth. And those fees are pretty expensive. They charge hundreds of dollars to have power at your booth at some of these trade shows. And so they said, you know, you go to two trade shows and you you pay for your battery. Well, they've scaled up now. And so, you know, they've got battery systems that will power a whole festival. So people go to like those live concert festival kinds of venues. And, and instead of rolling up big diesel trucks loaded with batteries, they're are loaded with, you know, diesel powered uh, generators that just grind and spew and make noise during a whole festival. They roll up the truck with, uh, the batteries and it just silently sits there delivering power for the during the festival so it's not interfering with the the quality of the experience in any way so really we see some cool companies and and all of these that i'm talking about seem to be at this point very successful uh growing i'm not saying they're all profitable but they're all growing and and making steps uh and raising money and yet none of these uh, we're venture back now at the other extremes there are all kinds of situations like over the last 24 months we've really seen the flow of venture capital really drop right uh it's really slowed you track this carefully i'm sure and but crowdfunding uh volume has stayed flat the last couple of years and so it continues to be a resource so i think a lot of folks when they reach a point where they're struggling to get venture capital will do a crowdfunding round and sometimes it's just once it might be their very first round it might be it's kind of a new i think in some ways easier way to do a friends and family round i think it's easier in that you're not limited to your rich friends you can go to your ordinarily you know your ordinary network uh and and that allows you to get the money from people who are closer to you you don't have to go as far um so there are some advantages there but other people will come at different spots in time, uh, often when they reach a, a difficult funding point, and they'll realize, hey, we've got some customers, we've got some clients, we've got a network, uh, we can raise money from the crowd to keep us going until we can raise a venture round. Um, and then the a third kind of exciting case is we're seeing uh, some people who are raising 
after they've raised a ton of venture capital and don't need money. Uh, you know, that we talked a little bit about Substack the other day. So Substack is the platform that hosts my show and my my newsletter. And we, uh, so Substack, uh, very without any warning to us at all, said, we're doing a, a we funder round and we're going to try and raise some money. And this is your opportunity to invest. And, and uh, the people on the platform put up $5 million in one day, in one day to fund uh, Substack. Now, Substack had already raised tens of millions of dollars. They didn't need any more capital. But what they did in that exercise is they locked in some of their most successful, most passionate uh, authors. So now these folks... I mean, if you own a chunk of Substack, the odds of you switching and and instead going to Medium or some of the other players that are popping up in this space really drop. So they locked in as owners a huge portion of their most successful, most passionate customers. So it was a brilliant strategic move even though they didn't need the capital. So we see all kinds of different reasons and timing when people jump into the crowdfunding space. But it's it's a it is, I think, here to stay and and I think we're gonna see it continue to grow in coming years. I think twenty three or excuse me, twenty four is gonna be a great year for crowdfunding. Sense. And the second point that I one of the major takeaways I had from you in our discussion before this podcast was the Crowdfunding being a modern version of friends and family rounds. Um, so maybe for the audience, what, what exactly did you mean by that? Well, you know, traditionally, uh, when entrepreneurs start, the first round of capital is that friends and family round. And oftentimes, you know, it's a little bit, it's it's messy, right? I, 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 when I was doing my investment banking business, we saw it over and over and over again that people would conduct those offerings without talking to a lawyer, document them poorly, and then they would end up in a situation where it wasn't really clear what the cap table was and what exemption from registration they had used. And so what they had done inadvertently was to essentially give all of those investors a right of rescission. So they could just say, I want my money back. And legally, they could demand it. Now, whether they could get it practically is another question. But that legal right had been established by doing an offering poorly. So uh, now with crowdfunding, instead of going out and, and either spending a lot of time to do it right under Regulation D and offering this only to accredited investors and, and sticking to your network, I mean, there's a lot of constraints. Instead of doing it that way, you can do a crowdfunding round and do it very publicly and bring in every aunt, cousin, friend, high school buddy, college chum, whatever you want. You can bring in anybody and, and you can bring them in a hundred bucks at a time, a thousand bucks at a time. Yeah, you're still going to need to look at, around and find some of those folks that are going to put in 10,000, 20,000, 50,000. But you can also bring in all of these other folks who may really, really want to be shareholders and investors or somehow involved, even though they can only put in a hundred, two hundred, five hundred dollars. And but as a group, it starts to add up, right? When on average, investors are putting in a thousand bucks a piece. I, I think that average is skewed by people who put in 10, 20, 50,000. Uh, when we take those folks out, I think a more realistic average is about 500, but 500 bucks at a time from your non-accredited or non-angel investor network, that's pretty good. Most of us have 100 people that we know really well that we can go to. Um, 100 people times 500 bucks is a lot of money uh, can, you know, for a startup, if that's your, really your first round. And it's what a lot of people need just to get going. Well, hundred percent. And I mean, you mentioned some of the, I guess, some of the scary parts when it comes to people not knowing what they're doing when they're doing an offering, uh, especially in a sector that has some serious litigation. So we talked about you know, like tampon tribe, Kickstarter, 
all the way up to companies doing you know seventy five million dollar raises. So maybe we can, I mean, just for the audience, maybe maybe we can just walk through like when it makes sense to do a larger offering. I guess what is a larger like what is Reg A, Reg A plus, uh, or Tier One, Tier Two versus a Reg CF, and maybe maybe just to acquaint some of the masses with. Uh, like some of the investors who are listening to this this um, presentation, or people that want to perhaps join one of your events later on, like what is how does the how does the industry play out? Like what is a Rex EF? What is a Reg A plus? And who should do what at what time? Yeah, that's a great great question. So Reg CF allows people to raise up to five million dollars, but even within that context, there are several other sub tiers. Uh, if you're going to raise up to $124,000, there's really very little lawyering or a professional accounting required. You, It's pretty much a do-it-yourself. Now, some of my lawyer friends would take umbrage at this suggestion, but I think, let me say this, I'm confident that a lot of people are doing right raises under $124,000 without lawyers and without accountants. They're doing this largely on their own with the help from the platform. So um, that is really nice to know if you're trying to do a very small round that you don't need to have a lot of capital up front to raise capital. Um, as you uh, move upstream, you have to get things like a review, uh, an accounting review. And that sounds like a, an informal thing, but it's actually a very formal thing that's very much like an audit. So if you're going to raise between 125000 and I think $1.25 million, you have to have a review. And again, it's almost an audit. Um and that requirement doesn't go away if you just started your business. If your business was just formed yesterday, you still have to have an audit. It is a ridiculous requirement. Uh, and if you're going to do over a 1.25 million, you need to have an audit. So if you're raising more money, more is required in terms of preparation. And that means you have to have a little bit of the money before you can actually raise. So that helps you think about where you fit in Reg CF, right? If you have zero, you really probably want to be thinking about doing a one of these raises of 124 or less to capitalize, even if that becomes your process for funding the ability to do a larger raise. Hmm. And then uh, from there, uh, above five million dollars, you want to be looking at Reg A, and you were talking about the tier one, tier two, I think 5 million is the cutoff for tier two. But with a Reg A offering, the SEC is actually going to review the filings. With, with Reg CF, you do have to do some filings. Typically, the portal will help you do the filings. It's not as in, difficult or in, quite as intimidating as it sounds. Uh, and the SEC does not review them. They give you no feedback. They just require that you do it. With Regulation A, it's more like a traditional IPO where you're going to file a statement with the SEC and they're going to review it to decide if they think it is adequate disclosure for the raise you're doing. And so that takes serious lawyering, right? So now we're talking about spending real money, tens of thousands of dollars typically just on the lawyers. Um, depending on the raise and circumstances, typically an audit is required. But under these rules, now you can raise up to $75 million under the tier two rules. Uh, and so it is a very, you know, that's a substantial amount of capital. And so it is becoming a, a critical source. And there is a path. It's a little bit tricky. It's not automatic, but there is, um, you get when you do a regulation A offering, tier two, what we call the A plus. Um, when you do that offering, there is an option to become a public company. And so you, you can do what is an old fashioned small IPO. You know, in the olden days, before the dot-com boom and bust, small companies went public. 
because there were fewer hurdles. And then, you know, Sarbanes-Oxley and some of these rules came into play and made it very difficult. And 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 one of the effects of that really hurt ordinary people because it prevents them from participating in the growth of companies. So, for instance, I Facebook is one of my favorite examples because everyone would have wanted to buy a few shares in Facebook early on. But it didn't get to go public until it had a valuation of $100 billion. All the growth, all the real upside was done. And only wealthy people got to participate in the creation of Facebook wealth, really. And the rest of us kind of got boxed out. Uh, in contrast, when Microsoft went public, it had a market cap of, I think, of $300 million. And so there are you know, people who bought ordinary, you know, ordinary folks bought shares 40 years ago in the Microsoft IPO, and they are now worth a thousand times what they paid. <laughs> That's pretty good. That's pretty good. Literally, uh, you know, I, I think, what, what is it? So 300 million to uh, about a trillion. So that's like, that's like 3,000 times. Uh, that, that's a pretty good investment. You put 100 bucks into that and you have 300,000. So I mean, it's a serious return. So yeah. Facebook didn't give us that opportunity. And, and now Reg A Plus gives us that opportunity, right? If you want to create a public company, it's a small reporting company, you can do that with Reg A. That's kind of an interesting, exciting part of this. You don't have to. Another great thing, right? You get the optionality as the issuer to decide whether you're going to be a private company or a public company. So it's really cool. Sorry, I, I talk too much uh, not to forgive me, but I get, I just love this stuff. I just love this stuff. I do too, like, and uh, and I get it because because maybe, and I don't know, I didn't check the, the filings, but maybe something like, uh, you know, Facebook when they were scaling, maybe before they went public, they had something like a Regulation D 506C offering, perhaps, and then, you know, maybe for the audience and, and even myself, like, sometimes I wonder if somebody does a Regulation D, from what I understand, I don't think they need to do any audits. So, you know, perhaps, perhaps you can talk about the benefit of the Regulation D and how maybe it's for more passive investors and how maybe for crowdfunding, it's more for users that are also investors, which is what we discussed yesterday. Or, um... Yeah, yeah, I think there's there's some truth to that. that. There's no question that Reg D offerings dominate the landscape uh, by far. I think that the, the volume of, total volume of deals done under Reg D is on the order of a trillion dollars a year. It, it's how offerings are generally done. Um, angel rounds, private equity rounds. It's the way venture funds raise the money that they invest. So some of this is being sort of counted twice, right? The venture fund raises it and then the venture fund uses it, right? So it's it's the same money going through two layers of, of, of accounting, but you know those deals are getting done. Um, so it's very popular. It's well understood among affluent investors, right? You have to be accredited, generally speaking, to participate in, in the deal. Um, under Reg D 506B, you can have 35 non-accredited investors, but you have to give them extra disclosure, which then most attorneys take to mean you have to give everyone that extra disclosure. So it adds costs that make it look a little bit more like some of these other, you know, like the crowdfunding offerings when you use it that way. So generally speaking, people don't let non-accredited investors participate. Um, and under Reg D 506C, where you can be public about the offering, it's strictly speaking, there is no exception. It has to be accredited investors. So um, these are well understood among accredited investors, but because they box out 90% of people from even considering them, there's that, in my mind, fundamental flaw, right? And it's a flaw both in terms of the issuer trying to raise capital from their community, the people that want to support them, and a flaw from the standpoint of public policy and wealth creation, right? If ordinary people aren't allowed to invest in the good opportunities, uh, they are missing out on wealth creation opportunities and we're perpetuating things. And because 
there is because of historic and and I would argue even ongoing systemic problems of racial division in these wealth creation tools across the board. Anything we do that perpetuates uh, poverty or at least fails to accelerate wealth creation is penalizing people on a racial basis. And th that's one of the reasons why I love crowdfunding, right? Because it allows everyone to participate in that upside. Um, so yeah, um, it's more, quite frankly, a public policy issue, uh, a social policy issue that motivates me to advocate for crowdfunding than it is the idea that it's a better way for issuers to raise capital. Because like you say, the, you know, the, there's a lot going on under Reg D. Um, it's a familiar, familiar model. Uh, but I don't think it's necessarily better just because it's familiar. Oh, 100 percent. And um, one thing that I find interesting is that we have this thing of regulatory capture and you talk so, about the growth of crowdfunding. So I guess what is the maybe we can look at bottlenecks to growth of crowdfunding and what would it take for crowdfunding to, I guess, maybe have less friction or to grow faster? Because, I mean, trillion dollars per year is not a joke. So, so. No. Would, would, and, I, and I took a look at the FINRA portal and I saw the list of crowdfunding websites. It takes like a few seconds to scroll to the bottom of that list. So what, what, is the, um, what, what are the next steps for crowdfunding in the future? How is it going to become that future? Yeah, I was, uh, I, I sort of joined the crowdfunding community literally in the weeks after President Obama signed the law, the bill into law back in 2012. And, and we all recognized very quickly that the rules for crowdfunding made it inefficient as a tool for raising capital. And so as we talked amongst ourselves back in that time frame, what is going to fix this? Many of us said it's going to be technology, right? that people will come along and build technology that makes it easier so that it's not so burdensome. We really haven't seen that yet, but uh, I am a loose advisor to a company called Raiseway, uh, and Raiseway is doing exactly that. They're building software that is designed to make the capital raising process much easier for founders, right? That they will use artificial intelligence and other tools to radically accelerate the process of preparing those filings and the business plans and all the stuff that needs to be done so that you don't get bogged down in cost and time right and and if we can if we can see that roll out successfully or a competitor to the company so that people can raise money and and accomplish great things uh, easily that's going to be a key thing the other side of the coin is on the funding right? The investor side. And I think artificial intelligence, again, is coming to bear. I've been working on some very simple, uh, almost rudimentary AI tools to help investors do their due diligence. The, the fact is, due diligence has a tremendous correlation with returns, right? From an investor standpoint, if you do lots of due diligence, if you're really thoughtful, you are going to make better decisions and earn more money on your capital, period, end of story. Um, the data suggests it's it's radical, radically different. Uh, one study said that people who are doing more than 40 hours of due diligence per deal as angel investors were getting seven times the return of those who averaged less than 20. Seven times the return. So this due diligence pays off. If you're making a $200 investment, you can't spend 40 hours on due diligence. So we've got to find some tools that help accelerate that. So I think there are some things that we can do. Investing in groups so we can divide up the duty of doing due diligence a little bit. That helps. Artificial intelligence. That's going to help if we can get the bots to do some of the groundwork. A third thing that's already helping is the disclosure requirements, right? 
when you're investing in a regulation crowdfunding, more disclosure is required than if you're doing a Reg D offering. So you don't have to ask the founders half the questions that an angel investor has to ask because it's required disclosure. So there are some things that are accelerating this process and allowing us to make good investments more quickly. But that's that's the one of the key challenges is overcoming hurdles. So. Oh, oh yeah, and um, and, and I, I do quite remember too. Like if somebody's investing, you know, a few million bucks into a real estate development as a limited partner, you know, that seems to be more like there's less community involvement or even LP or even venture capital funds where people are like passive LPs. I, I guess my, maybe maybe my question here is like, how much of the crowdfunding would you say are for people that are like, for example, Substack, you know, like they're actually quote unquote users for lack of a better word of the product versus people that are just like, it's like they treat it almost like uh, going to interactive brokers or Ameritrade or something and then hoping stocks go up. Uh, what, what's the sense? Yeah in the market there? I, I think we see both, right? The, the, the coolest, sexiest tech, even if you can't afford to buy it, even if you don't ever in, expect to use it, does attract capital, right? Uh, so you can take your story, even if it's been rejected by venture capitalists, you can take it to the crowdfunding market and say, look at my you know, flying car technology. It's really cool. And there will be people who say, yeah, that's really cool. Uh, I think that should exist and I'll invest in it. Um, but you're right. Uh, the closer you come to being able to communicate with people who are your customers already or who want to be your customers, like Aptera is a great example of the want to be, right? So Aptera is building the uh, solar powered EV and uh, raised millions and millions of dollars. I think uh, somewhere in the range of 35 to $50 million so far, a lot of money. Um, you know, they're able to do that because people want to buy the car, right? They actually want to get one of these solar powered EVs. Um, and, and then of course the Substack example is people who already are customers. In fact, they only communicated the offering by email to their founders. They didn't, you know, put it out on social media and stuff. And it took one day to oversubscribe the offering. It was completely sold out and they never had to send another email. I mean, it's pretty remarkable. So it's, uh, we kind of see the gamut, uh, but there's no question that if you have the customers, uh, that's a great starting point. But a lot of people, uh, let me give you the, the, one of the classic examples that a lot of the people who are listening to your show uh, are, are people who have small businesses that will probably never attract venture capital. They're listening for a variety of reasons because they're excited by entrepreneurship. They love what's going on. They want to participate. Net with crowdfunding, they can do a lot of the same things, but they don't ever have to get the venture capitalists convinced. They can just, you know, give their friends and family the same kind of deal they might give the venture capitalists. Oh, awesome, yeah. awesome! And, and and perhaps like speaking to the to the audience, um, we can also, I mean, we can share ways that people can get in touch with you, you know, your events, and explain that. But but as we jump into that, what are some key takeaways people should take? in terms of how they should use, or I guess let's just go to the people, an investor, how they should use and leverage uh, the idea of crowdfunding, or you know, somebody in real estate, how they should use and leverage crowdfunding, or people that I want to perhaps uh, raise money to buy a business or to run a business. So maybe you can walk through the different use cases for people listening sure. to the video, how they sure. can work with you. I like to point out to people that even people who don't think of themselves as investors, like some th those in your audience who think of themselves as entrepreneurs, uh, of course, you know, if you're really being honest, you are investors, right? And so I want to encourage you to start thinking about proactively being like a little angel investor. I, I call them cupids or not cupids, cherubs, uh, cherubs, right? That's the little baby angel, right? Uh, and so you can do that. There's one platform. SMBX that allows you to invest $10, right? So, so you can start with as little as 10 bucks. You can start with a hundred bucks if that's a small amount for those of you who are listening or thinking, well, that's a waste of time. I'll do a thousand, do a thousand. That's great, do a thousand. Uh, but you can invest these small amounts and, and become 
a, a, an actual investor in the same way a venture fund does, but you don't have to pay the venture fund fees. So it's 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 a cool thing. You can build portfolios around a debt strategy, uh, an equity strategy, or a hybrid strategy. So there are tremendous opportunities for return. Do your due diligence. Great opportunity, great market for investors. Okay. Um, if you're in real estate, uh, a lot of people in real estate are doing some kind of development, even if it's at the smallest kind of level, flipping single family homes. There are ways to do raise that capital via equity crowdfunding and uh, or investment crowdfunding. And you can share that with share the risk and the upside with investors who help you out. Uh, and and it, all the way, whatever your scale is, crowdfunding can play a role. Again, it, the potential is there with the Regulation A crowdfunding to do up to $75 million. I, I profiled a guy uh, that leads Wall Street Capital Partners, um, a, a, an Atlanta-based firm. Uh, uh, he looks like you. Uh, and he his name is Joel Miller, and he's doing a big project, $48 million in um, Old Town Alexandria. And for his project, uh, he's doing... $1 million of, of offering for the crowd. And his motivation for that was not because he needed the capital. He knew right where to get the capital in tra more traditional ways, but he wanted to give other founder, other people, including prospective developers who want to learn from him, people in the community who want to share in the economic upside of this project in their neighborhood that may inconvenience them in the short run that may cause their property values to increase in the long run for better or worse, right? From a property tax perspective. So allowing them to participate economically in the upside of the project helped to address some of those community concerns. So now he's got community investors as well as the people who are his fans. He's got a, a podcast for uh, people who are kind of coming behind him, wanting to be successful real estate developers following in his footsteps. They follow him. Now they can invest in his deal uh, and learn more and participate in the upside of his project. So that's a, uh, you know, real estate. Um, what were the other examples that you wanted me to address? Yeah, you got half of them. I think perhaps uh, maybe M&A buying or people want to acquire a business. Uh, oh, yeah. That's when we're just business in general for the final. One. Yeah, I think... Um, you know, for M and A, I think crowdfunding has some really exciting potential. Imagine that you're you're looking at a business that has a good customer base and a retiring owner, right? You want to come in and be able to buy that from it. Kind of the old school M and A LBO model would put a lot of stress on that business. Maybe even put you in a situation where you're forced to lay people off as the first thing you do. You use a crowdfunding approach you may be able to take some of the debt burden out and lock in some of those customers as long-time committed customers by making them owners in the business or even debt holders, right? You could do it. You could, you can issue whatever you want to issue, right? You could issue subordinated debt. So you could bring in your senior, senior lenders and then issue debt to all of those. So you can be, get kind of creative. You don't have to, you know, it's not paint by the numbers. It's, it's oil painting, in the extreme when you're doing crowdfunding. So you could come in and use that as a key critical part of capital. You know, you could do set up an ESOP, set up a leveraged ESOP, give the employee some ownership, and then do, uh, in addition, do the crowdfunding raise for the, the customers. I mean, there's some really cool, sexy opportunities to really change the game of M&A to make it work better for building companies rather than just stripping them for parts. So it's a really cool, cool uh, play there. And of course, in general, right? Any business, you could be a hundred year old business. There is no reason you can't do a crowdfunding raise uh, that would make sense, right? Uh, in a lot of circumstances, uh, you know, if you can borrow money from the bank at 4%, maybe that's your best bet. I don't want to tell you that there's always going to be a crowdfunding raise that, you know, that's better than what you could get. But for a lot of people, there's a situation where the bank's going to say, no, we're not going to do that, period, right? And then you're looking at other more expensive sources of capital. 
in those cases, crowdfunding should be on the table. Let's look at it. And again, you don't have to sell equity. You can sell debt. You can sell convertible debt. You can sell whatever you want. It is so cool, the flexibility you get. So anyway, lots of options. If anybody's listening to this and you're in one of those categories, uh, just follow Devin's advice because you you, you just got gold. And um, yeah, definitely, especially in the M&A side, it's really uh, under, if you have a startup idea or or you want to start a crowdfunding portal or you want to do some acquisitions, that's a really underserved market especially. So yeah, just take those golden nuggets for what they're worth and uh, hopefully you apply some of them. So so this was, I just love the conversation so far and I think we may want to get people to take some action here. So you're involved in several events. You have a, this huge newsletter running and, and maybe we can tell people how to get in touch with you. So if somebody wants to learn about crowdfunding, maybe they want to you know, get, get more involved in the community and they want to spread the word, how can they get in touch with you and uh, all the things yeah. that you're up to? I'm open. Uh, you can email me at, at uh, devin, D-E-V-I-N, at thesupercrowd.com or visit The Super Crowd to check out our events. Uh, we've created a discount code mm -hmm. for our upcoming events. Uh, you can save 50% at Supercrowd24. It's a virtual two-day event in April. Uh, save 50% with the code RAISES. RAISES will save you 50% uh, at Supercrowd Baltimore coming up in next week. Next week will be in Baltimore, Supercrowd Baltimore. Save 30% with the discount code RAISES. Uh, we'll be in Chicago on June 12th. We haven't started selling tickets, but we'll set up raises as a discount code for Supercrowd Chicago as well. Save 30% in Chicago uh, in uh, in June, June 12th. So uh, raises, discount code, that's the key thing. And you can come to our events uh, and I'd love to connect with you there. But feel free to email me with questions, Devin, at the supercrowd.com. Oh, yeah, you're definitely going to get some inflow in. Uh... Yeah, you heard it here first. Discount code raises, and then this is for Devin's events. There's one in you said in one week, or in, or in a few. Yeah, Baltimore on March 21st. March 21st, and another one in you said June, right? Yeah, June is in Chicago, and then our virtual event, two day event, April 17th and 18th, Super Crowd 24. Okay, yeah, everybody watching this, make sure you go to these events. Uh, seriously, it's a, it's a really good investment in yourself, your business and obviously from them your family and, and your community so take the take it seriously this is a you know this is a pretty i haven't heard of somebody this knowledgeable who created investment banks and was deep in the process who's this deep into crowdfunding so you're going to grow your business doing it so yeah so i, I think um maybe maybe we can start to wind everything down because so far it's been really good so i guess if there is one thing, so just to take a, a bit of a left turn, if there is one thing, whether it be business, uh, business life or otherwise, uh, that you want people to uh, remember you for, uh, what would you be? What would it be? And what would you say that you know? Hey, when it comes to what I do, this is what I represent, and this is what I want people to remember me for. Well, I, I like to say money's only real value is the good you can do with it, and what I would extend from that is one of the key ways to do good is with our investments. We can invest in black founders, other diverse founders, women that get 2% of venture capital. It's nuts, nuts. Women are getting, you know, so we have, we can have so much impact just by screening for the founders we back and looking to support founders who are disadvantaged by the current venture capital system. But we can also look for the, the, the the projects that support causes we care about, whether that's global health, uh, social injustice, or uh, like climate change. You know, there are projects galore, right? There, there are 500 offerings at any time available in crowdfunding, and the number's going to grow. I am convinced the number's going to grow. And, and so you can go screen, you can find five deals in your space and pick the one you want. And then next month, there are, but there are five new ones in your space. And you can look and pick the one you want and do that every month. So cool. Please be an investor in crowdfunding, even if you've never thought about it. Use your money for good. That's what I want people to think about 
when they think about me. Awesome. Use your money for good. There you have it, everybody. Uh, let's end on a high note. Use your money for good. This is Devin Thorpe. Make sure you get in touch with him. The links and everything will be in the description with the discount codes and everything. And this has been the Razor.com Top Capital Razor Show. You heard it here first. And Devin, it's been awesome to chat with you here. Thank you. It's been an honor not to thank you so much. I really appreciate it. So great to connect.